let's move then to the to the next paper. Uh, the next paper is about um, how do banks manage liquidity? Evidence from the ECB's uh, tiering experiment. And uh, I see the presenter also already online. So uh, Jean David Sigou from the uh, from the ECB. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Tobias. And I'd like to uh, uh, start by. Uh, by uh, thanking the uh, organizers for letting us uh, present our paper uh, today. So the paper I'm presenting today is called How do banks manage liquidity? Evidence from the ECB's Turing experiment. It's with uh, Luca Baldo at the Bank of Italy and my ECB colleagues, um, Florian Heider, Peter Hoffman, and Olivier Black. Let me first uh, talk about the research question and the motivation of this paper. So the research question is actually in the title of the paper. How do banks manage their liquidity? And the answer to that question is not obvious. Because banks have a lot of leeway in, um, in the management of their liquidity leeway in the composition of their portfolio do they hold reserves sovereign bonds or even assets that entail some haircuts leeway in the use of liabilities to raise liquidity like borrowing reserves from other banks and leeway in uh, how they dynamically rebalance their liquid portfolio Stating the obvious, liquidity is important for banks. It reduces the risk of runs and spillovers to the real sector. It also acts as a buffer to absorb payment shocks. Now, understanding how banks manage their liquidity has major implications. One set of implications is for spillovers. A shock on one liquid asset may or may not spill over to another market, depending on how banks manage their liquidity. And in particular, this affects the extent in which monetary policy as a shock to reserve transmits to a securities market. It has also implications uh, for bank borrowing and lending behavior. It enhances our understanding of uh, banks' uh, reliance on short-term money markets and on their use of intra-group capital markets. So it's an important uh, question to tackle. With the research question in mind, how do banks manage their liquidity? Let's, let me talk about the methodology. So in this paper, we explore the shock that led banks to rebalance their liquid portfolio. And the shock that we explored is the introduction of the two-tier system for remunerating excess liquidity holdings that we will call tiering for short. It has been introduced by the ECB in October 2019. And according to the system, up to a limit, excess reserve holdings is remunerated at zero basis point instead of minus 50 basis point. Let me say that again. Part of the reserve holdings up to limit is remunerated at a rather attractive rate, zero basis point. And if the bank has more excess reserves than that, it's remunerated at minus 50 basis point in excess of the limit. So one can think of tiering as a decrease in the opportunity cost of holding reserves up to a limit. Hence, one can expect a higher demand for reserves for going up to the limit and a lower demand for close substitutes of reserves. So in this paper, we have two steps. In the first step, we we spent a, a long time verifying that the shock indeed led to a rebalancing. So uh, the prediction here is that banks rebalance their holdings of close substitutes of reserve. 
meaning they decrease their holdings of such assets. And our identification strategy is a difference in difference. So as to be able to solely capture the rebalancing that are induced by this shock and nothing else. In the second step, since we have established that there is a rebalancing, we study the rebalance. And in particular, we test two alternative uh, hypotheses. Um, the first hypothesis is that the rebalancing uh, preserves the portfolio uh, composition. Meaning, if before the shock, a bank had one third of sovereign bonds and two thirds of uh, intra group loans, for example, it must be, if the, that hypothesis is true, that after the shock, it still has one third, two thirds. The only difference is that after the shock, the size in euro term of this portfolio would have shrunk in order to be able to finance the increase in excess reserve. And we call this hypothesis trade-off. This, as, um, this term of trade-off as a reference to uh, the uh, corporate uh, finance literature. The exact reference is not important here for this talk, but you just have to understand that it may, trade-off means that each substitute of reserves has some pros and cons, and it leads to an optimal liquidity uh, structure that is somewhat time invariant in absence of shocks. The second hypothesis is simply that the rebalancing is such that banks used a single substitute of reserve. For example, banks lack very much to sell sovereign bonds in order to get liquidity. Then according to that hypothesis, to accommodate their liquidity need after the shock, that's what they did. They only decreased their sovereign bond hold. And we call this hypothesis pecking order. And this term just means that they have a strong preference for a given uh, a substitute of reserves. And once, of course, uh, they sold all of it, they go to the second best. Our identification strategy is um, we do counterfactual simulations aligned with theoretical benchmark. Okay. And as for the, the difference in different strategy and that strategy, I'll talk about the details uh, uh, more during this uh, presentation. What are the results? The first set of results is that the shock led banks to rebalance holdings of freely closed substitutes of reserve. First, money market loans, second, intra group loans, and third, marketable securities holding for a total of 3.40% of assets, which is quite large. The second set of results is that bank behavior is consistent with the existence of a trade off, i.e., an optimal liquidity structure and not so much with a pecking order. That is, banks rebalance proportionally to their pre-shock holdings. And it suggests that banks have a target allocation indicative of a trade-off. On the contrary, they do not seem to have an absolute preference for a given substitute of reserve. Now, what are the implications of our finding? First implication is for spillovers. Because banks are using several markets for their liquidity needs, it means that shocks on reserves are spillovers into several markets and including securities markets. The second set of implication is for policy. Our findings on bank preferences, i.e. here trade-off, can be used to predict monetary policy impact 
on market trading. And finally, um, we find that the banks that were most in need of excess reserves were able to get those excess reserves from the banks on the other side of the spectrum that were holding a lot of these reserves. So it means that the supply of reserves in the euro area has somewhat some elastic features, or at least to be conservative, it's not perfectly inelastic. Let me uh, dive uh, more into the, uh, the paper now. And we're presenting the data. In this paper, we, we use two proprietary databases maintained at the ECB. The first database is on bank level balance sheet data. We do so for 241 banks in the sample with a representative coverage across jurisdictions and business models. And we take this data on a window before and after the shock. So from May uh, 2019 to February 2020. So that's a five months before, five months after window. And the second database that we use uh, gives us bank level uh, reserves holdings data for the sample. Let me talk now about the first step. The goal of this first step is to verify that the shock indeed led to a rebalancing. And for that, we consider the sources of liquidity that are close substitute of reserves. Money market loans, i.e. short-term loans among banks or the financial uh, system in general. Intra-group loans, i.e. loans among banks of the same group and marketable securities, for example, your area government bonds. So what we imply is that lending to the ECB or lending to uh, a bank or to the treasury, these are somewhat substitute investments. And our identification is a difference in difference. Now it's a good time to talk about this identification. So, and I'm going to do so with this figure. So this gray bar uh, symbolizes the holdings of excess reserves of a bank, or the heterogeneity, if you want, in our sample. Some banks will be at the bottom of this bar. They don't have uh, much excess reserve. And some banks will be at the top. They have a lot of excess reserve. And here I've placed, um, the tiering limit, just uh, arbitrarily uh, um, located. And our goal is uh, to define what is the control group and what is the treated group. Let me start with the control group um, in red here. As a control group, we took the banks that are as close to the tiering limit as possible. So you want banks that uh, after the shock have no incentive to increase their holdings of excess reserves and no incentive uh, to decrease their holding of excess reserves. And those are the banks that are as close as possible to the tiering limit. For the treated group, you want uh, banks that are far below the tiering limit, so they have incentives to increase their holdings so as uh, to get the attractive rate of zero basis point introduced by, by the uh, two-tier system. And just let me tell you that uh, one might have thought that the right control group are just the banks below the tiering limit. But it's actually not true. We find out that the uh, banks with large holdings after the shock are banks that are going to decrease their holdings of an excess reserve. They're actually going to transmit this excess reserve to uh, the treated group. And that means that if you use this, uh, these banks as control group, you would, you would, mismeasure 
your treatment effect. For example, if the treaty group increases by 2%, their holding of excess reserve, it means that the large holding group are decreasing by 2% and you will have a treated effect of 4% instead of the actual treated effect of 2%. So that's why we went for this control group. All right, what's the empirical setup? On the left hand side, you have bank I's holdings of a certain substitute of reserves at time t. On the right hand side, you have two dummies. The treated uh, dummy, which is equal to one, if the bank is part of the treated group, i.e. far below the tiering limit, and zero if it's part of the control group, i.e. near the tiering. You have the tied dummy that takes a value one if t is after tiering, zero all the way. The innovation here are the fixed effects. We put country time fixed effects. And why? Because the distribution of countries in the treaty group somewhat differ from that of the control group. So if there is a shock at any time in one country and you, you don't put this fixed effect, the shock may affect more the treaty than the control group, and you will capture that in your beta, in the treatment effect. And you don't want this. So that's why we put country time. Now, here I'm going to present you uh, a set of graphs that represent uh, the main results in this first step. And the three graphs are all uh, similar, so I'm going to spend more time in the first one and less in the second effort. So what do we have here? On the x-axis, you have the time. And with the uh, red bar uh, uh, placed here at the time of the shock. On the y-axis in this graph, you have net money market lending scaled by total assets. What are net money market lending? This is loans in the money market minus deposits in the money market. And in particular, if you want to raise excess reserves, you would want to decrease your net money market lending, i.e. either lend less or borrow more. Two groups in this graph are represented, the treated group in plain and the control group in dash. Ideally, what you want is the two groups to behave similarly before the show. And that's what the graph tells you. On the left of the red bar, the two groups are somewhat similar. But as soon as the shock hits, you see the gap between the two groups widen. And in particular, we observe a decrease in net money market lending for the treated group, which is consistent with the desire to raise uh, excess reserve holdings. We find the same thing on the intra group. Uh, lending market, i.e. the loans uh, that a bank grants to the affiliate of the same group minus uh, what it borrows from the group. And here again, we see, we observe the decrease in net intra-group lending for the treaty. Finally, for securities holdings, we find that uh, the treaty group decreased its holding of securities after the shock. All three results are consistent with a willingness to raise excess reserves. Now, these results are summarized uh, in the table here with somewhat more details. What you can see is the treatment effect, effect in the third column is negative as we expected, i.e. the bank sold some substitutes of reserves in order to be able to increase its holding of excess reserves. There are two um, back of the envelope calculations that we can do here. 
The first one is the total treatment effect in percentage of assets. If you do the sum of the free coefficient, you get 3.40% of asset. This is close to 2.80%. What is this 2.80%? This is the average increase in excess reserves in the treated group. And it turns out that those two uh, 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 figures, numbers, are statistically the same. What does it mean? It means by focusing on solely those three substitutes of reserve, we capture uh, most or even all of the action. The second uh, back of the envelope uh, calculation we can make is in to do that in euro terms. So if you uh, take this 3.40% and you multiply by the average uh, bank size, you get 2.30 uh, billion per bank. Multiply again by the number of treated banks and you get roughly 200 billion in our sample. This is the same magnitude as uh, 227 billion, which is the total amount of unused allowances. What does it mean? It's a term that tells you that prior to the shock, if the banks that are below the tiering limit were to go exactly at the limit, it will need to increase excess reserve by 227 billion. Once again, it's close to uh, roughly 200 billion we're capturing here most of the effect of the action. Now, in the paper, we have more results about this rebalancing, and maybe I'll have time to talk about them uh, after the, the discussion. But let me now focus on the second uh, step. What is this goal? The goal of this step is to study the rebalancing among the substitutes of reserves. And here, again, we test two alternative hypotheses. The first one, the trade-off hypothesis, is a world where the rebalancing preserves the portfolio composition. Again, if prior to the shock, I had one-third of sovereign bonds and two-thirds of intra-group loans, I still have one-third, two-thirds after the shock. The second, the alternative hypothesis, the picking order, is simply that banks lack very much to use a given substitute of reserve, and they use solely this one. What is our strategy here? Methodology is to compare actual rebalancing to counterfactual uh, rebalance. Now it's a good place to explain it. Sorry, Jean David, uh, you have five more minutes. So that's good. Thank you. Uh, this symbolizes uh, the asset side of the bank. The bank has some reserves, some substitute X, and some substitute Y of reserve. And observe that here in this example, they hold 50% of X and 50% of Y. We start with that prior to the shock. Then we observe by how much reserves the bank uh, increase its, uh, by how much the bank increase its holding of excess reserves. In this example, it's everything that is above the black line. Then we ask ourselves, in theory, how can the bank finance uh, or perform this increase in excess reserve. Well, one benchmark you may think of is actually to sell some of X and some of Y in the same proportion. And that's uh, represented in this figure. And we call it the trader counterfactual. Why same proportion? It's just because the bank started with 50% of X and 50% of Y. If it had started with one third, two third, it would be one third, two third. Then we go on and uh, 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 design another benchmark. Theoretically, the bank, what it could do is only use X and not touch Y. And this is the pecking order on the factual. As a fourth step, we look at what actually happened to this bank. And in this example, the bank sold both X and Y a bit more X than Y. And we ask, in statistically speaking, what actually happened, is it equal to the trade-off benchmark where 
x and y have been sold in the same proportion or the picking order benchmark where x only has been used. Said differently, we test two sets of new hypotheses. The first set uh, gives you the distance between the actual rebalancing and the trade-off rebalancing. And the second set gives you the distance between the actual and the picking order uh, rebalancing. And the neural hypothesis uh, tells you that the distance is new. And we do that via OTD t square test because um, we are, um, uh, because uh, we, this is a generalization of uh, the uh, t-test because we're working in a vector environment. Right. Let me uh, spend the remaining time on this uh, table and then I conclude. This table gives you the results. The first colon for the trade-off and second, third, and fourth colon for the picking. It gives you the distance between the actual uh, uh, rebalancing and the trade-off uh, re rebalancing. If the distance is close to uh, zero, you, uh, you uh, will fail to reject the neural hypothesis and the p-value will be above the conventional level. If it's far from zero, uh, you will reject the neural hypothesis. What are the results here? If you look at the first column, the distance is close to zero and the p-value is above the, uh, the conventional level. This means that the rebalancing preserved the portfolio composition. If you, on the contrary, if you look at the second, third, and fourth column that simulate the picking, the distance between the actual and the picking order uh, counterfactual, the distance is uh, sometimes very uh, far from zero and the p-values are way below the conventional le level so we can reject the picking order. It's time for me to conclude. So in this paper we ask how do banks manage their liquidity and we do so by using a shock that lends banks to rebalance free substitutes of reserves, money market loans, intra-group loans, uh, marketable securities for and then we study this rebalancing. We find that banks rebalance proportionally to their pre-shock holdings, which is consistent with a target liquidity structure. Conversely, they did not seem to exclusively rely on one source of liquidity. And this has important implications. First, shocks on reserves as spillovers into several markets, including securities markets. Second, our findings on bank preferences can be used to predict the impact of monetary, monetary policy on market uh, trading. And finally, the third implication is that the supply of reserves in the euro area has some elastic features. With a small caveat, that hearing was a cautiously calibrated policy. And so this third implication is valid only in this uh, context. All right. Um, Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion by Paso. Thank you, Jean David. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so then, yeah, let's move right away uh, to the to the discussion, and we have uh, Vasil Yamudu from Bayes uh, Business School at the University of uh, London. Um, Vasil, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, so let me uh, begin by uh, giving a short um, overview of, uh, of what the paper is about. So the paper is essentially asking the question, how do banks manage their liquidity? Um, they studied the different sources and uses of liquidity. So different markets on central bank reserves, uh, interbank market, um, uh, um, uh, lending within uh, affiliate groups, uh, um, security holdings, and so on. So the key uh, aspect there, the, of the paper is that they study how a shock to one of these markets uh, spills over possibly to, to other markets. So the shock they, they are studying is a shock to the cost of holding central bank reserves when the ECB has changed its um, um, the, the cost uh, uh, for, for banks of holding excess reserve. Um, they exploit the two-tier, um, what they call the tiering system, and, and that uh, lends itself to and if in different analysis since the effect was heterogeneous across banks based on the holdings of um, 
of um, central bank reserves they were holding prior to 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 this change in uh, October uh, 2019. Now, what do, why do we care about uh, studying this? I mean, one um, the obvious um, the obvious uh, um, reason is uh, the analysis is, is going to be informative about how monetary policy uh, uh, about monetary policy transmission. Um, but it also is informative about, uh, so the first one is, is, is important for central banks, how they conduct their monetary policy. The second is understanding um, possibly the, the preferences uh, banks may have about uh, their liquidity. Um, the author study effectively two types of um, um, uh, possibilities, example possibilities, where one which they call the trade-off theory, um, is the idea that uh, banks have a preference for a stable portfolio. Um, they, they have various uh, trade-offs, uh, costs and benefits of a associated with a particular source uh, of liquidity, and uh, they choose a certain, um, um, a certain ratio is optimal for them, and therefore we will expect as the shock changes, they are going to so, um, keep these weights constant. Um, um, the other um, possibility is that they actually have a pecking order, so they prefer one source of uh, um, versus another, and they are going to exhaust um, when uh, something becomes more available. They exhaust any additional, you know, liquid, um, uh, uh, any ex additional liquidity from that particular source. So they expect we will uh, we will expect a shock in that case that that will lead to changes in their relative weights. Okay. Um, here is what they find. Um, so the first, I mean, the, the key results are, uh, just to summarize, is that um, the shock here is a decrease in the cost of uh, central bank reserves. Uh, um, uh, I, I won't go into the specifics exactly already. Uh, Jean David explained that uh, quite well. But the adjustment we observe here is indeed that they, the banks did adjust their, um, their, um, their holdings of various other sources to, to raise their reserves. Now, one, one result is that the banks acted swiftly, uh, that they, the, any price effects that they saw, they were only short lived, um, then they revert very quickly back to the steady state. And, and sort of the, there is the supply of reserves looks fairly elastic in this context. Um, in terms of how, where they, they, how did they raise the reserves? I mean, they, um, there are three things that they are checking on, and, and what comes out is that the increase came through uh, an increase in net borrowing, uh, mostly from borrowing from banks who were on the other side of the spectrum, and they were not so much affected by the decrease in the cost of holding reserves. Um, the, uh, they also decreased lending to um, the net lending to affiliates, um, and they also decreased their uh, security holdings. Uh, of government bonds, in particular, the effect seems to be stronger. I'm not quite sure why, but on from on domestic government from domestic government bonds. So, when it comes to the, the question between pecking order versus trade off, the result seems to be supportive of the trade off rather than the pecking order uh, hypothesis. So, in, in summary, these are the results. So, now let me um, give you very briefly my comments and thoughts, which. Um, uh, one, uh, I mean, when thinking about the paper um, uh, and, and thinking about the, the literature, many of the uh, papers in this space focus on one market of, of liquidity. Uh, and, and this paper essentially is actually studying several markets and spillovers from one to another. Um, the key result that comes from the paper about the fact that the uh, banks don't seem to have a preference uh, and a pegging order uh, has implications in monetary policy and transmission in the sense that um, um, you know, any particular shock in this context uh, will lead to um, smaller uh, price uh, pressures than otherwise, either in that market or others, since there is no strong preference for one or the other. So the effects on pricing are going to be smaller. It also implies that uh, monetary policy uh, is more predictable if, if banks uh, um, have a, um, yeah, they, they have preferences more consistent with the trade off theory rather than the pecking order. Um, many papers in this in this space focus on on crisis periods. So, so they look at a moment where there is a lot of re, um, risk, and they study the, the effects and the contagion at that time. Um, now, this paper informs about stock transmission in normal times. Um, I mean, the authors don't use that. It, it's my choice of, of words. Um, they don't say exactly normal times. But what I would like to draw attention here and, uh, and ask for more information. Is, I mean, the context here is, is not a shock, it's not a crisis period, but it's a period of negative interest rates. I mean, they define the initial steady state prior to the shock. There's also ample aggregate liquidity, 
So my question is uh, how much of the results uh, may be uh, specific to, to the initial steady state? And, and it will be helpful um, if the authors could, could expand a little the discussion on this uh, to help the reader understand um, whether these are specific to this period or we are expecting them to give an existing theories and other evidence from, from, from other papers, if they can guide the, the reader in that to think about this. Um, now, in terms of the treated and control groups, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the treated groups and, and control are, are basically distinguished, and, and uh, Jean David already explained that quite well, based on their reserve holdings prior to the shock um, relative to whatever the tiering allowance limit was. Um, now, if, if, you, if you want to, to look at it, I, I have a little uh, graph here which uh, sort of distinguishes this. Um, so that you could think of the treated group as those who are way below the limit. Um, and those around the, the control are those around the limit, above and below. Um, the idea is that uh, um, because those are, are very close to, to the allowance uh, uh, limit, they have little incentives to adjust. Um, while th these ones uh, are far away, the incentives to, to, to adjust are much larger. Okay. Now, of course, one, one question I had when and looking at this, I mean, one of the results of the paper, and I think uh, Jean-David um, concluded with a reflection on that, is that um, one of the results of the paper is that banks acted swiftly and then the, the, the supply of reserves is elastic and there are, um, and my question is is this a result or is it a design feature so the the, cho the limit was a, a choice uh, um, so uh, monetary authorities uh, have probably picked that limit very carefully to ensure uh, that there are going to be um, uh, uh, no undue shocks to the system so um, I don't know uh, if I can generalize that. Um, maybe the conclusion here isn't about the elasticity per se, uh, but maybe that that particular experiment or that particular intervention was uh, yeah, effective and, and without effects, without um, uh, long run effects uh, uh, in the market. Um, now, the the other common I have, I mean, we can see from the from the analysis in the paper, the control banks tend to be uh, different than the um, treatment banks, that, that's all right. Um, they tend to be, the control group tend to be larger banks with smaller deposit base, more central bank reserves by definition, and, and more securities issued and, and so on. Um, I think it would be interested, uh, interesting to, to, to sort of see how much, uh, um, and that goes back to my earlier question, it would be interesting to see how much of these uh, differences on you know, where they are on the space of reserves um, is stable over time. And so, of course, benchmarking it to whatever is the available level of reserves at a given point in time. So you may be uh, doing um, uh, an analysis and that, that could be potentially in, uh, useful to see um, how much of this analysis here is, is, uh, is specific to this period or with the negative interest rates or, or, or an ample liquidity in the market or, or, you know, there are some stable patterns in terms of who is present in the, you know, the available space of, of reserves uh, um, at each point in time. Um, now, um, sorry. comment. Just, just, yes. you have just one, one minute left, sorry. About yeah, I'm, I'm closing, no problem. Uh, so the, the, one of the key questions, as, as uh, one of the key results of the paper, um, so that, that, that was about the elasticity uh, comment and the negative interest rates. But now one of the, of the comments is, that one of the key results is that banks appear to have a preference for a stable structure of liquid assets and in turn to that uh, structure after the shock. I mean, there is a trade-off uh, cost and benefits and that, that makes optimal a certain um, ratio for them. It will be interesting, I think, if, if the authors could expand uh, um, some on the paper uh, to provide some information about which structure um, and, um, is optimal for whom and how that varies with different characteristics. Now, that can be in, a, in the form of discussion and guidance on corporate finance theories where similar uh, ideas are, are present. It can also be incorporated with an analysis in the paper. I wasn't quite sure how exactly to bring it in the current system. One possibility which I was looking at is to, to, to try to have uh, heterogeneous treatment effects and exploit the cross-section of the time series in this case, given that the experiment per se uh, doesn't lend itself for, for uh, naturally for yeah, different uh, periods. Um, overall, I enjoy reading this paper. This is very nice and interesting paper, well clearly uh, written, uh, rich uh, with many interesting results. And uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to, to look at it. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, Vasa, for the, for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Um,
so I think we have a well, actually, we have exhausted our time, but maybe let's have five five more minutes on 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 general discussion. So I'm just looking at Pat whether there's there's anything. Otherwise, I would hand over to Jean David to maybe respond. I don't see anything in the in the chat. Maybe maybe just one one question from from my side. I mean, maybe related also a bit of what what Vasa was saying about the the heterogeneity. Uh, I was just wondering whether you looked into the question of heterogeneity across banks and to what extent, for example, the stable portfolio result, you know, um, you know, varies, for example, across uh, different different banking types. Um, Perfect. Anyway, but maybe you can just just take on the questions. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Vaso and, and, and Tobias. So let me start with the heterogeneity. Uh, um let me uh, actually thank you vaso very much for this y you touched on the um very very uh, good points um and i'm not going to be able to address uh, all of this but let me start with the heterogeneity it's a great um it's a it's a great suggestion uh we haven't done so uh for the picking order uh trade off uh, results and that's something that we could do with a small limit that you know uh, you don't want to uh, to uh, you cannot refine so much uh, this analysis because you need a critical uh, sample uh, size. But otherwise, uh, uh, that's something that we can do. For the rebalancing, we did explore uh, the heterogeneity, and we didn't see anything uh, that was uh, major. So the heterogeneity in the rebalancing didn't seem. Uh, to be uh, so large and uh, did not warrant um, us to uh, to mention that. Uh, let me talk about the steady state. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, maybe some of the results are dependent on the steady state. And I would say that most of them are. I mean, it's like uh, any empirical uh, paper, you uh, you really bonded by your, your sample uh, time. Um, uh, so, um, what we could do is we would take your suggestion to see if uh, the what we find can be also uh, found in the literature uh, i'd like to i would like to add that the literature on, on uh, bank liquidity management is not so large so uh, let's see what uh, we find uh, there um, for the fact that tiering was a, a carefully designed i think that let me push back a little bit here and i think it's actually a positive feature in the sense that if pcb didn't do a good job there uh, the rebalancing we would have observed uh, would may have been very different from the rebalancing that banks wanted uh, uh, to implement i.e we would probably not have been able to observe the true bank preferences but because uh, tiering was well calibrated, there was not uh, too much stress uh, uh, on the uh, banking uh, system, and therefore we were able uh, to to see um, the, to observe the true preferences of uh, banks. And finally, on your comment about the character characteristics, are they stable over time? Uh, that. Uh, Definitely something we can uh, look into. All right, Th thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Jean David, for a very interesting presentation, and of course, also thanks a lot to you, Vaso, for uh, for your discussion.